I'm Harry Dietz, editor of the Reading Eagle. We have come together tonight to experience part of what makes our nation so great, the right to freely select our leaders. And it's important that we hear from these candidates about where they stand on issues and what they plan to do to govern and to improve our community. We welcome tonight's participants. At the far end, Republican Jim McHale, Independent Frankie Graham, and Democrat Wally Scott. Please listen carefully and respectfully to what each candidate has to say. Please consider who will be the best leader for our city. And then please consider an option to go out and vote. You have a choice. Most people choose not to. Please go out and vote so that we can have a, the right candidate on November 3rd when the election's held. I'm going to turn the program over to Dave Mowry, our managing editor for The Eagle, who will explain the format, introduce the questioners, and serve as the moderator for tonight's forum. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Go over the format quickly so we can get on, on with the questioning. First of all, if you have a cell phone, please turn it off or mute it so it doesn't interrupt the speakers. We all appreciate that. Secondly, we will not be taking questions from the audience. We ask that the audience be respectful of the candidates and not interrupt any of the candidates when they're speaking. Questioning tonight, or fielding the questions tonight, will be Ron Southwick, our news editor, and Leah Migdell Smith, who covers politics for the newspaper. Each candidate will have 90 seconds to make an opening statement. Each candidate will have 60 seconds to respond to the questions. And after all three have answered the same questions, each candidate will have 30 seconds for a follow up. We will rotate the order of who answers first. At the end, each candidate will have 90 seconds for a closing comment. Jim Kerr, our assignment editor, is in the front row with a timer. He's already been pointed out to the candidates so they can keep an eye on their time. And with that, we'll open it up with uh, Wally Scott's opening statement. You can come Let's get here. seated. That's why you're mic'd. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Oh, my God. Can everybody hear me? <clears throat> Hi, I'm Wally Scott. Um, what can I tell you about myself? I'm born and raised here in Reading. Um, I've lived here all my life. Uh, I uh, lived on South 9th Street. I only lived really a block and a half away from uh, most of uh, my life where I lived at when I was growing up, which was 21 South 9th Street, and I live at 910 Washington. When I first came to Reading, I uh, was in an orphanage over in uh, where Alberni College is today. I was there from seven months to almost, I think it's seven or eight years, depending on when they actually closed, I think it's 57, 58. I've been involved uh, in the city of Reading, uh, trying to do a good job for everybody. I'm a person that likes to help people. Uh, I don't push people. Um, I'm running for this chair, obviously, because of the fact that I think that I can do a great job, and I'm asking you for the opportunity to let me show that to you. A lot of issues in my campaign deal with uh, forensic audits, the truancy law, parking authority, uh, the Water Authority, Community Development Codes, Zoning, Public Safety. As we go on tonight, if I hear questions on them, I feel very uh, relaxed to answer them and tell you what uh, I'd like to do or see uh, for the future of the City of Reading. I think all of us sitting here are looking to make sure that we don't go into uh, receivership in 2019. So please, I'm looking forward to tonight. Thank you. All right, thank you. <clears throat> All right, I guess I should have also asked for there to be no applause after each candidate or we'll be here all night. We have questions that we want to ask at the end, feel, f feel free. Mr. Graham. Hi, my name is Frank, is this on? Yes. Okay. Hi, my name is Frankie Graham, Jr. I was born and raised here in Reading, just like Wally. Um, I grew up here in Reading as a, in a very interesting environment. 
and I didn't understand my environment until I got older. Um, like many here, I, I had an interesting grown, uh, childhood, single parent raising me, and it exposed me to a lot of things that a lot of kids and young adults here experience every day in their life. And I wouldn't have been able to get through a lot of those things without the mentorships I had experienced growing up and the counselors here who helped build me up to where I am today, in addition to the military. Um, I graduated from Reading High School in 2004 as a member of the National Honor Society, um, multi-sports athlete. I was even at a point I was ranked number 17th in the nation in the high jump. Um, when I went to college, I went to college looking at ways I could help the city when I got to the, when I got to the ability I could do so. And I was thankful for the opportunity to work with former mayor Tom McMahon in his office. And that time in Tom McMahon's office, I was exposed to a lot of things, and I wanted to continue some of the things that he did. And I'm here to serve everybody, sincerely, and thank you for your time. All right, Mr. McHale. I want to thank the Reading Eagle and the Reading Area Community College for hosting tonight. I want to thank Ron Southwick and Liam McNeil Smith for putting us through what you're about to put us through. And thank everybody here for coming and spending your time. In 2011, when I ran for mayor, my life was drastically different. I started the campaign as a confirmed bachelor, but then along the way, I became a, a husband and a father of three. After looking at how much my life has changed, I began thinking about the city of Reading, and I realized little has changed. In fact, things are worse. Our mayor's office has been raided by the FBI, and our city council president was forced to resign. These actions follow a deep history of corruption in the city of Reading. Reading's political machine and its elected leaders have failed the city and kept residents in the dark for far too long. We need a break from the past. We need to look in a different direction. I'm not a politician, I'm a businessman with ideas born in the real world. I will work for more and better paying jobs, affordable taxes, stronger schools and safer streets. In order for Reading to move ahead, we need new ideas and a fresh perspective. I'm 100% committed to a brighter future for, us tomorrow, for all of us tomorrow. My name is Jim McHale, and I want to earn your vote in November. All right, with that, the first question will be for Frankie Graham. Okay. First question is going to deal with public safety. Um, are there different strategies you'd like to see the city police employ to deal with crime in the city? Absolutely. Um, interesting was over a week ago when we had our uh, <coughs> ideas in the newspaper, a lot of the things that um, I worked on for the proposal and, and, and pol policies to uh, help city was not written in those articles. Um, but this Sunday, there is an article written about York, Pennsylvania, and a lot of the things that I actually had planned, I have planned for the city if elected mayor of Reading, actually has been done. Um, they are doing a community watch program that I'm trying to bring back. And I built that program up with a former classmate at Reading High School. His name is uh, Joshua Fazek. And we're trying to build up the community watch program. And at the same time, we're also trying to improve the relationship between the police department and citizens of Reading. Um, and that program comes from a mentor of mine when I was a little kid. His name is Ronald Ross. And we're going to find a way to improve the relationship between the people and the police department and at the same time um, improve the safety of the city. All right, same, same question, Mr. McHale. For far too long, the political machine in Reading and its candidates have paid lip service to public safety, but delivered no real results. The statistics remain staggering. 87% of the cities in the United States are safer than Reading. Parents should be able to let their kids walk to school and know they're safe, but they can't do that. Reading is dangerous, but things can change. I will implement new policies, procedures, and appropriate police staffing levels. Technology like cameras <coughs> is nice, but it can never replace a real person working within the community. By prioritizing our budget and implementing real changes, we can and will make Reading safer. Mr. Scott, same question. What is the question again? Public safety? 
Yes. Are, are there different strategies you'd like to see police employed to deal with crime? Let's see police employed as what? To, to, are there different strategies you'd like to see police use to deal with crime in the city? I think the police are probably doing the best they possibly can with what they have. For all the years that I sat as a district judge, which is over 20 years, um, I found one thing is that in order to fight crime, you've got to know what the crime is. The city of Reading, we have more than our fair share of people that are addicted to heroin, that are addicted to crack cocaine, and to other forms of drugs. My feelings have always been this. If in the judiciary itself, and even with the police department, if I'm fortunate enough to make it, I'm going to be looking for stiffer sentences for the dealers and to try to do some rehabilitation for the people that are on drugs. And here's why. The dealers cause the problem. The addicts are basically, they're addicted to the drug itself. But if we just lock the addicts up, we lock them up for a year, or we lock up, well, that's fast. We, uh, let's put it this way. I believe that dealers get jail time, addicts get rehabilitation time. I think that'll help stop crime. All right, crime. thank you. Mr. Graham, 30-second follow-up. Um, I was thinking about the ideas that Mr. Mahale says about increasing the police force. Um, about 10 years prior to he moved to the city in 1999, the police force was at the number he's talking about. He was the <coughs> ideas of getting to. And I was sitting here in city council with Ron Rouse with the police cadet program, and we were talking about bringing the um, Army National Guard in to try to improve the city's safety. And we still had the police force at that number, but the thing is we have to improve the relationship between the people and put people responsible for their own actions instead of trying to look at someone to fix us. All right, thank you. Mr. McHale? It all comes back to enough boots on the ground to be able to solve the problems of the city. And Mr. Graham alluded to the fact that before we were in Act 47, we had 100, or 215 police on the streets. Now we have 168. That's a big difference. If you're a criminal, where are you going to go? You're going to come to Reading. There's not enough cops. We all know it. We live in the city. We know the problems. If you call the police, they're unable to respond because there's just not enough of them. We need more boots on the ground. We need good police processes and procedures. Thank you. Mr. Scott? I'll follow up on my own. Um, what I'm looking for, the reason I say that with addicts is because of the fact everybody knows somebody that's had a, that's had a drug problem. They could be in your family, whatever. Uh, if we don't do something to rehabilitate them when they come out, they still have the problem. Locking them in a prison does nothing for them. The second thing, if I may say this to you, is it wouldn't matter if you had 500 policemen in the city of Reading. If somebody's going to commit a crime, they're going to commit it. I was involved in the judiciary. There's nobody here that can predict where a crime's going to take place. A killing takes place because of, a, of an incident. So I'm asking you to please think about when you're talking about something, make sure you really understand what you're talking about. All right, thank, thank you. you. Next question, <coughs> Mr. McHale, you'll answer first, please. Well, keeping with the idea of public safety, and uh, a few of the candidates alluded to this, but what, what do you think needs to be done about police and firefighter staffing levels? And if you think more are needed, how would you suggest that the city pay for it? Well, it's kind of the same thing we've just been talking about. We don't have enough. We don't have enough police, and we don't have enough fire. And they're the two principal things that city government is charged with taking care of, making sure that you're safe, and making sure that if there's a fire, you have sufficient fire in there. We just, we don't have enough people on the ground. We have fire trucks going out, multiple fire trucks, because they don't have enough people to put onto one, which is the way they should be running the fire trucks. We have been cut to the bone for Act 47. Our services have been cut to the bone. And when you look at Act 47, it was never designed as a uh, financial recovery program. When you boil it down, it was raised taxes and lower services. And we've been suffering ever since we went into Act 47 in 2010. That needs to change. All right, thank you. Mr. Scott, same question. Well, <clears throat> I believe the cameras are a great deterrent. And until we can get the money to get more police on the streets, we should be spending the money on cameras. Uh, there was a, the, the homeless person that was beat and killed up there, at, uh, I'm thinking the laundromat on Penn Street. They would have never caught the people who beat him and then later he died if they didn't have cameras. And the cameras that went, most of the crimes, I remember the chief stating it, most of the crimes that, are, uh, that we're able to solve are done because neighbors have cameras. Everybody's starting to get a camera in a block someplace. It does deter crime. I think that more and more people should make them more visible. That would stop perpetrators from coming into your neighborhood and committing crimes. The uh, second part of it is, I, I go back again to that one of the basic reasons we have 
a lot of crime is drugs. And we must put ourselves in a position in a position that we help that. There's not enough beds in city in the city of Reading to take care of those that are mentally ill, those that are on drugs, and we need something for that. And that's what I intend to try to do. Mr. Graham. To answer the correction the question directly, is the reason why staffing numbers are down is because of Act 47. Act 47 was placed there to help the city recover and pay off its debts. Yes. Yes, the taxes have gone up. Yes, the services have gone down, but that's a sacrifice that was, not a sacrifice, that's actually a burden that was put on everyone here in the city because we had elected the wrong type of people in prior administrations. If we had the proper administrations leading the city in the right direction, we wouldn't be in Act 47, and we wouldn't be at the chance of us going into receivership if it wasn't for irresponsible spending, illegal activity, and corruption. And if people who actually were in office prior to uh, in prior years would actually did their job, we wouldn't be in Act 47. And this, the whole idea of us going into receive, receivership and everyone acting like it's not a big deal, it really is. If we go into receivership, that means everyone here in the city loses their voice and there's no such thing as a mayor or city council. And that's what Act 47 is about. We need to follow those guidelines, not recommendations, to get us out of the trouble we are in now. Okay, thank you. Mr. McHale, follow-up? To the staffing levels, it, we didn't change anything. It's kind of like a lot of things you see in Reading. You sit here, you discuss it, but nothing really changes. Bottom line is we need more people, more boots on the ground. We need more firefighters on the trucks to, to make sure that they're safe and to make sure that we're safe as well. Mr. Scott. I know you asked something about the firefighters as well as the uh, policemen, right? And what would we do to what, to increase their numbers? Is that what you asked? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, the only way you're going to increase the numbers is back on the backs of the people of the city of Reading. Act 47 it makes me uh, smile because we have a former mayor sitting here that put us into it. But uh, I often said we shouldn't be in Act 47 because at the time that it happened, our government wasn't transparent. If it was transparent, we probably would have saw that we didn't have the need for it. There's a lot of complications uh, with going to people that are poor. We are the poorest city. And how do you ask them for more now? All right, thank you. Mr. Graham. When thinking about how to use the forces as so efficient as we can, um, we do that in the military. Since I've been in the military, we've been downsizing. We have to do more and more and more with what little we have. And we are trained properly to do what we can with the minimum number of people. And we still succeed at our, at our uh, mission. But the thing is, what's going to change Reading when it comes to using the forces efficiently is we have to improve the relationship between city government and the people. And if we can improve that relationship and give, <coughs> motivate people to do the things they need to do, we won't need as many police officers. All right, next question. Mr. Scott, you'll answer first. Okay. We're going to move over to economic development um, at this point. Um, as mayor, what would you do to make Reading more attractive to companies to come into the city and create more jobs? Well, I think we have to change the environment of our city. One is crime, obviously. People don't want to come here if there's going to be a lot of crimes that are committed. I think we have to get a, a good working relationship, finding out exactly what the skills are, number one, of the people in our city, what they're qualified to do, what we have to offer to attract businesses here. The second part is I, 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 we give so much money away, and I don't think that we should be attracting them by giving more tax-free zones. Because we're in a position now where we, the people of the city of Reading, all those people that are getting the millions, spending the millions, and building the corporation, we don't really have developers, we have builders, and they're making money. They don't care if the project works. They don't care if the building's not going to be there. They, most of them get five years for, for, their tax, uh, for the tax on the property that they don't have to pay. And the more I look, and the more I look at our city, I think it should be more that the, we shouldn't be trying to attract people here. We should first be trying to attract good people to stay here. Once we do that, we can get business to come to us. All right, Mr. Graham. Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah. Repeat the question for him, please. Okay. Um, would you, what would you do as mayor to help uh, the city attract more companies to create jobs in the city? I'm actually in the process of doing that right now as we speak. Here in this room, there actually is a CEO, board executives, and engineers right now from the filter holder group, a job, a company I'm trying to bring here to the city would bring 150 to 200 manufacturing jobs. 
um, skilled jobs, and also uh, technical training jobs. These jobs will pay anywhere from thirty dollars to $50,000. Instead of talking about what can we do, why don't we do something right now, and I'm doing that before I even get into the office. And I'm trying to find ways at the same time to improve the safety of the city and find ways for people to want to stay in the city and also bring people to the city. And we do need some types of incentives. And until we are able to um, find ways to make the city more safe, we, we're going to have a difficult time trying to bring people here. You know, we have this crime the way it is. Uh, there's no jobs. That is the main problem. There's no jobs in the city of Reading. Why would you want to come somewhere when there's no jobs and no ability for people to take care of their family? <coughs> Mr. McHale. On September 26th, I released a detailed economic growth and opportunity plan. This plan does not rely on gimmicks. It attacks the root causes of economic problems. I was recently at the Doubletree Job Fair where 1,500 people showed up for 170 jobs. That's great, but that means over 1,300 people will still not have work. It's clear. The people of Reading want to work, but there are no jobs. The unemployment rate in Reading is considerably higher than Berks and Pennsylvania in general. A family in Reading earns about $34,000 less than if you were in, outside the city. This has to change. As a business professional, I know what needs to be done to bring new employers and good paying jobs to our city. We just need to make the right decisions so everyone can thrive today and in the future. Mr. Scott, follow up. I think that the most important thing that I look for in any business that moves here is that they move here because they want to. And that they think that we have the economy or we, we have the structure in our city government or the people that basically they're looking for to work. Um, I don't have all the answers, and I don't believe that everybody here has the answers either. If they did, we would have all been in the process of changing it a long time ago. We are, if you've lived here all your life, we see Reading the way it is now, and we dream about where it could be. That's what I'm looking for, and uh, I intend to do my best. Thank you. Mr. Graham, follow up? I was thinking about something Mr. Scott said about there's not enough places here in the city that pay taxes. That might be true. There's a lot of nonprofit organizations. But the thing is, yeah, that, we might not have these businesses coming in paying taxes, but we need the jobs. Everybody needs a job. If everyone can have a job, the crime rate goes down, st family stability increases. And with that, you have more money being put into the con local economy by the people who live here because they have money to spend. And if we have jobs here, everything changes. Mr. McHale, follow up. Well, part of our problem is our housing stock, and everybody talks about this, but here's the bottom line. If you buy a row house for $40,000 and put $30,000 into it, it's worth $40,000. It's not worth more. There's no demand. We have done our level best in the city to push businesses and residents out of the city and collapse the demand. I intend to change that flow and create demand and get jobs back in the city to make the city successful once again. All right, thank you. Next question, Mr. Graham, you'll answer first. Keeping with the economic development efforts, uh, a lot of the focus recently has been on the downtown area as well as the 50-acre Riverview Industrial Park. Would you continue those efforts as mayor or would you have your own initiatives that you would be pursuing? I have my own initiatives that I would like if I was Mayor Redding, but um, there's a lot of things that Mayor Spencer had started that were good, and few of those things need time to actually develop. And he, he was on the right track, it just got a little sidetracked with other things, but it, he was on the right track, he was a little sidetracked on other things, and uh, it, infl it pretty much deterred him from what he was really trying to do, but uh, I'm looking at doing things um, different, and I'm looking at all opportunities to bringing uh, new opportunities for people to actually have jobs and to look at ways to balance the budget and make sure that we actually have some money to actually invest in the city to do something. Because right now, the way the finances are, we can't really, we're really limited in what we can do. And that's the honest answer. We are so limited on what we can do, anyone saying that we're going to do this, we're going to do that is not telling the truth. Thank you. Mr. McHale. I've personally spoken to the majority of business owners downtown. 
unlike my opponent, I have worked in the real world. I'm not a career politician, I'm a businessman. Most of our elected officials are career politicians. They've not worked in the real world. In order to bring life into downtown Reading, we need to look in a different direction. I will make downtown Reading better without ignoring the neighborhoods. A better downtown means more jobs and prosperity for everyone. With fresh ideas and new perspective, we can create a much more vibrant community. Mr. Scott. Well, I don't know about you, but I think that we need more than a hotel downtown to bring people here. I mean, unless the Pope slept there and I'm Catholic, maybe I'd stop by it, okay? Uh, it will be successful. Everybody says it'll be a failure. It can't be a failure. It's right across the street from the Santander. But I think what we have to do is we have to get fresh ideas for downtown. I talked about a railroad museum, and I talked about it as I go door to door, telling how we can bring people here to see the Reading Railroad. Everybody has a piece of us, but nobody has the Reading except us. Second thing is I looked into uh, finding out after people started asking me, can you get the train routes going? Can we go to New York? Can we go to Philadelphia? That brings new people here. That brings new families here. We need people here in our city. We want to increase the number of people that we have. We want, to, we want to bring fresh ideas. We want to bring new people that want to invest. I think what we do is we start with what we have, try to bring new people in the best way that we have, but we have to have an attraction. And I'm thinking that so this is a great attraction. Monopoly helped us tremendously when they put us on the board. I found out lots of people here in Berks County and Reading love trains. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Graham, follow up? In response to both of them, um, I'm the only candidate up here who actually has real world experience working in City Hall. I'm the only candidate here who actually has education in government. I'm the only candidate here that actually walked along the streets and going <coughs> from house to house doing inspections, codes, inspections, and other things. And I'm also the only candidate here who has a full grasp of what's actually taking place in City Hall because I actually worked there. And also, I know not to be promising people a railroad station in the middle of town where there's no parking available, and it failed, and it, the idea failed, and it's actually Thank in Hamburg right now. Thank you. Mr. McHale, follow up? I've heard about this railroad museum. There's a railroad museum in Scranton and Strasbourg and Hamburg 30 minutes away. Selling, celebrating Reading's rich and prosperous history is great, but we need to fix the problems we see every day. Spending more tax money on a museum is crazy. Only someone with no real world experience would ever suggest risking your taxpayer money on such an uncertain idea. Thank you. Mr. Scott, follow up. You know, I got this philosophy. I believe that if we can dream it, we got artists here in Reading that can draw it. If you can see it, we can do it. I know the railroad will succeed. If it's just me that's going to fight for it, I want to tell you that every person I've talked to wants it. Every person I've talked to wants to be part of it. We have people all over the city in Berks County that want to bring their Reading railroad cars, everything here, to our museum. If we're not willing to try something, you become part of the nay people. And those Nate people never get anything done. And they also think they know more than we do. And I say the people of the city of Reading are a lot smarter than you think. Thank Th you. Thank you. Next question, Mr. McHale. Uh, how would you as mayor keep families in the city and also attract new families to come from outside the city to come in and take a chance on buying a home in the city? Well, you have to start looking at the root causes of why people have been leaving. A lot of people don't want to be here. The taxes are too high. The crime is too high. There's no jobs. And when people look out and they look, at, they look at the schools, they get a little bit nervous. Right now, our children do not see a great city. I see it. Reading isn't clean and safe. And there are no jobs to aspire to. Children are influenced by what they see around them. And so are the parents. I will work with local parents, teachers, businesses, community groups, and school board members <coughs> to fight for better schools. A stronger school system is good for all of Reading because it helps our children succeed and attracts employers and makes a stronger community for all of us. Mr. Scott? I think one of the biggest reasons why people will stay here is because of their children and the fact that we do have a good educational system. Where our problems lie are with the gangs that are in the Reading School District. There's 15 of them. It starts at the Citadel level and goes up into the high school. 
We have 15 to 1,700 children going into ninth grade and less than 800 coming out of 12. I do think one thing. I see a lot of battles between the school district and the I-LEAD program. You ever see a child walk down the street and he has a shirt on that says I-LEAD? Just two words. They walk with their heads up. They're proud to be here. They're part of a system. They're also part of our city. I love Reading. I went through the entire Reading school system. I graduated then from uh, Mountain State University. I couldn't have graduated from there if I didn't get the education I needed here. We may not have the same problems, but we still have the same families. And I think that no one's in a rush to leave here. If the exodus that's coming is from the people who can afford to go, we have to make sure that the people that are here, we lift them and we don't push them. So I'm looking to take care of us, people of City Reading. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Graham? When I think about keeping families and having more people stay here, mainly families, uh, I think about all the conversations I have with uh, parents, a lot of the parents I grew up with. And the first thing that comes out of their mouth is the Reading school system is not really good. You have to look at the statistics of the Reading school district. At this point right now, the graduation rate is a little bit over 61%, which is 88%, lower than 88%, which is a state average right now. And if I was elected mayor, I'd be working hand in hand with the Reading school district to find ways to improve the education system with incentives, incentives I had created with finding ways for people at RAC starting at Iraq, uh, Votech would be able to go there for four years and when they graduate they have an associate's degree in that skill. And find ways to also have uh, the average Reading High student be able to go there and, and, uh, and get some classes credits towards college for generation, general edu education courses. And that's what we need to do. Find ways to motivate kids to stay right. in school and improve their Thank you. Stay here. Sorry. Mr. McHale, follow up. Another problem we have in the city, and we've got a few, is the city government relationship between the mayor and the council. In the past, they have not had a good relationship, but as a businessman, I've worked with all sorts of people my whole professional life. And I want to apply my real world experiences to make sure that we have a positive working experience going forward so that we have a strong city government delivering the services we all need. Thank you. Mr. Scott? I forgot the question. Where was it? <laughs> we were talking about retaining, keep, keeping families in the city and also encouraging families. To, I think to I pretty well summarized what I uh, would like to see happen. Could I say this to you? Uh, I've never met any child in this city that didn't want to go to school. I've come into a lot of resistance on why they don't go to school. But I can tell you something that I think is very important that we should be doing and that we don't do. I think we need more social workers in our Reading School District because we have more and more problems that come from the family. Listen, today they'll tell you that the children learn from the parents, and that's not true. They learn from the parents the right thing, but then they live in the real world as everybody talks about, right. and that's where they learn Thank the you. wrong thing. Thank you. Mr. Graham, follow up? Thank you. <laughs> uh, there, there's a lot of things we can do as a city to bring more people here for families to stay here but the thing is we are limited on resources and we need to find ways to get those resources but the thing is we have to start from the top and that's making sure that the Reading Municipal Government has a balanced budget that actually follows the, the budget and we don't go off on the side ways on doing things that we're not supposed to be doing with the money. If we actually use our money smart way we can do the things that we that bring the people to the city. All right thank you. Next question Mr. Scott. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> switching gears a bit, we can talk about uh, city finances. Um, right now, the city's proposing a two mil property tax hike to balance uh, next year's budget. Do you believe you could avoid raising taxes in future years? And specifically, how would you do that? Well, I think the biggest thing we need is a forensic audit of our city government, the budget, the community development, everything. Uh, even where we generate the most capital, which is with the water authority and with parking, we need a forensic audit of that. I mean, before you tell that you're going to increase taxes, don't you really want to know what the budget really is? The next mayor is going to be faced with the opportunity that he can reopen the budget. I say he because there's three men here. If there was a woman here, I'd say he or she. But uh, I think that whoever it is, we have to. We have to open that budget. We have to get a forensic audit. We've got to know what the bottom line is, what the amount of money that we have, before we go dreaming about whether they're doing the right thing or the wrong thing. Uh, I like the fact that people say Act 47. But Act 47 was put together strictly to save the government, not the people. Don't 
put yourself in the position, as I'm starting to realize here, that we're getting more and more questions on how to save the government. I hope they give us questions on how to save you. And I got great answers. I <clears throat> remind you about interrupting the candidates. Please hold your applause to the end. Thank you. Mr. Graham. Can I get the question again? <laughs> sure. Absolutely. The city's proposing a two mil property tax hike to balance next year's budget. Do you think that you could avoid raising taxes in future years? And specifically, how would you do that? First thing I would do was not get in trouble with the police department and the FBI. <laughs> <laughs> and I would have saved about $3 million. <laughs> and we wouldn't have to pay for their legal fees. The second thing is, um, at the point right now, there's nothing any of us really can do with the way the structure is right now with the finances. Act 47 is there for a reason, and we cannot stray away from those guidelines. If we would do, the city would go into receivership. And now, it's not something everybody wants to listen to or hear, but it's actually the truth. We have to follow those guidelines. If not, you all lose your voice in what we can do with the city. And they can always try to talk about, well, we can lower taxes, but we can't lower taxes right now. There is a huge debt that's been covered up from administration to from administration. They have moved money around. We're not supposed to move their money. There was $11 million moved away from a sewage fund back in 2011 that was not supposed to be touched. And that money could have been used to fix the sewer problems right now. And if, you, if we had the right people in office, we wouldn't be in the problem we are now. Thank you. Mr. McHale. Reading is essentially bankrupt. We are in Act 47 because Reading has failed to keep its finances in order. And if the city continues down this path, we will end up in receivership. When a city ends up in receivership, an outside organization liquidates our city assets and we have no say in the matter. That's the reality. Reading is running a budget deficit. We spend more money than we take in. I will look at real solutions by attacking root causes of the fiscal issues, as well as making common sense changes the way our finances work. I plan to exit Act 47 by the end of my first year in office. Mr. Scott, follow up. I think the only way you'll be able to exit is if you do the forensic audit. And we find out if there's any money that's here. You know, every forensic audit that's taken, and my, if I may say this, if the FBI does their job and they do it properly, and there is absolutely nothing funny about a mayor who's basically facing uh, a cloud at this particular time, as well as council and other things. And I know we could all laugh about that, but the truth of the matter is they're not the source of the problem. The problem lies in those people who think that they know more than we do those people who run our city. The elected officials are just elected, but we have to pick the right directors and Thank get you. the right body of people Thank you, that Mr. have Scott. honesty and integrity. Thank you. Mr. Graham? I don't see how we could get out of Act 47 after the first year with the finances the way they are right now. There's no, Act 47, is if we even do the bare minimum as we're required, we might get out in 2019. And even after we get out of Act 47, we have to understand when we're out of Act 47, the finances change a great deal. Act 47 allows the city to, to be able to collect more revenue. When Act 47 is gone, the city is not able to collect that revenue. So what, how are we going to do anything to keep a balanced budget or have money to do anything? Thank you. Mr. McHale. The problem here is we have three men up here and only one of them has a financial background. Only one of them has turned around failing, struggling companies and organizations and large, sprawling IT projects. Only one of them understands the accounting and the finances behind this and has the experience to be able to deliver us out of Act 47. It sounds kind of silly. None of this is that difficult. The politics are difficult, but none of the problems we face are difficult. These men do not have the skills to be able to deliver the city out of Act 47. Thank you. Next question, Mr. Graham. Uh, we've been talking about Act 47. We're going to stick with it. Um, there's concern that in a few years, the city might end up in receivership after exiting Act 47. How specifically do you avoid the city ending up in receivership? Specifics? That's a pretty hard thing to do when we, or neither of us are the mayor, know the book. Uh, there's, there's only thing, one thing we can really, a few things we can really do, and that's try to understand what we're getting ourselves into and looking at the budget in a way that we can make rational and 
responsible decisions. And to save the city from Act 47, what we need to do is make sure we hold on to all city assets, not leasing them, not selling them. Make sure we are able to keep them so we can use them down the road. Um, if, if we will lose our city assets, we're in, we're in much more turmoil than we realize. But <coughs> even though we try to do everything the right way at the mayor's level, from, uh, from our perspectives, it's really hard to answer that uh, with an honest answer on specifics on how to save city for Act 47, even though prior administrations all had business backgrounds. Mr. McHale. When someone has too much debt, they often look for a way out of debt. They might look at buying a smaller home or selling their car. Reading's in a bankrupt city because of our debt. Our elected officials have not done anything to fix the city's finances. The city government rightly last year looked into a long-term lease of our city water assets, but politics got in the way. Instead, they continue to lease our assets, our water assets, to Reading Area Water Authority. It's already leased. I propose we lease the water assets of the city to a professional organization which will give all of us PUC rate protection and proper grievance procedures. This will help us act, exit Act 47. We can start immediately moving toward a brighter future. Leasing the city's assets benefits everyone who ri resides in the city. Your taxes will become lower, your water, water bill will become smaller, and we will have control over the lease and what's in it and our water assets. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Uh, what was the question, to stay out of Act 47 or how? What are you gonna do to make sure the city doesn't go into receivership after exiting Act 47? I'll say this all night. You gotta do a forensic audit. And you know, I hear people on council say, can we afford it? Well, can we afford not to do it, okay? I'm hoping that the FBI does it. I've even asked them if they would do it. Uh, to stay out of Act 47, we have to elect the right people that basically hire the right people. We've had enough know-it-alls that know everything and want to micromanage our government. There's no one that knows everything about city government. There's no one sitting in this, at this table here that I can perceive that would have more knowledge than someone else on what to do in government. Look, I'm born and raised here in Reading. You're born and raised here in Reading. We've seen it when it was good and when it got bad and where we're going. One thing that I know two of us can guarantee you is we know we can't go back to where we were, but we certainly know there's a bright future if we stick with the stock and the good people instead of the government. Stick with the stock and good people that are here. We all can dream, and I still say to you, if we can dream it, we can do it. Mr. Graham, follow up. In response to the idea of leasing the water assets, it's actually, Rawa is actually what we, the city owns. We actually control what we do with water assets, leasing wise. And we also have to look at the fact that Altoona tried to do the same thing. They tried to look at leasing out the water assets as Mr. Mahale was saying, and they actually backed out of that deal and looked at what Redding doing. They wanna do exactly what we're doing. We have full control over our city assets at this point. Yes, when it says leasing, we're actually Thank collecting you, Mr. Money for ourselves. Mr. McHale, follow up. I drink water. I think everybody here drinks water. I'm concerned about the water. Don't get me wrong, the water asset needs to be protected. I simply want to change who we're leasing it to. To Reading Area Water Authority or the park or to a professional organization. When I open up my water bill, I see a tax bill. I don't see a water bill. Above all else, I would never do something without engaging the public. Part of my platform is ethics and transparency. I want to restore people's trust in government, and they're going to be involved in Thank every you. step of the process. Mr. Scott, follow up. How's that? That was my heart, OK? <laughs> Listen, no one's talked more about this Water Authority. I mean, I've held all the cases originally for the Water Authority, and some of the mischievous things that they do there, I believe are outright illegal. I mean, how many of you receive a bill and they tell you it's $1,000, and you say, how could it be $1,000? And you have nowhere to go. There's no appeal process in the Water Authority. You're sort of like stuck. But I will say this, if I may. I think the city of Reading and the people of this city can run that Water Authority better than the people that are running it now. Number two, I think we need good engineers that run it. 
and we got to get more and more people out of that authority that Thank are you, running Mr. it Scott. and better people in. Next question, Mr. McHale, you'll answer first. Um, over the past few years, there have been some very public battles between city council and the mayor. How specifically, as mayor, would you work with city council to avoid future disputes? Well, the good thing is I've met all the city councilors and I've had talks with them all. And half the problems, my view of half the problems, are they weren't talking. They weren't talking to each other. They're talking at each other a lot, but not to each other. And once you start the communication path, once you start getting into that, it solves a lot of the problems. So first, first things first is you have to get in the proper communication roles. But the second thing is the problems that the city council has had to face in the last several years are things they should never have been able to, have never had to deal with. They've been forced into their oversight role to a much greater extent than they've ever had to be in the past. Basically, the administration has been, has been poorly treating the city councilors, and I feel bad for them. They've been doing a good job, but the mayor's administration has really made it very, very difficult for them. So first thing is communication. Make sure we get into the traditional roles envisioned in the charter. Thank you. Mr. Scott? I think the number one way that you get uh, along with council is that you, as well as council, have to realize that they're there to serve the people of the city of Reading. If they know that, there'll never be a problem, because I would be there to serve the people of the city of Reading. The second thing is that if you really look at what the problems were, the problems were the council and the mayor's office. They basically, sp they basically spent millions of dollars to see who has more p power than the other. We wasted the money. Leave your egos at home or hang your coats up before you come in. Sit down. If you do the people's business, everybody will get along. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Graham? My training and education actually would have been very useful in this current administration when it comes to their disagreement with the city council. I have a master's degree in international relations conflict resolution. What that means is I have a degree in negotiations. And, I, and that, in that degree, it taught me how to talk to people and interact with people and treat everybody fairly with respect. And if I was mayor of Reading, I wouldn't even want to be called Mayor Graham. I would be called Frankie. And that's where things I think has problem with public officials is they always want to see who has bigger gonads than the other. And the thing is, I'm not that type of person. I treat people with respect and we're on the same level no matter what position. And with that being said, there would be no problems. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McHale, follow up? Again, it all comes back to communication. And I think all of us have said that to some degree in some different ways, but it has to be with communication. Um, we can't have million dollar lawsuits anymore. I mean, the city can't, it doesn't matter how prosperous you are, you can't afford that. That's just a silly waste of city resources. And I think most of the people in the city realize that pretty early. So I think you sit down, you have communication, open communication, open and transparent government, all those things really assist so that the city councilors can know what's going on. Thank you. Mr. Scott? No, I'm very fortunate to tell you that I believe at least half of this room, or maybe more than that, call me while we always have as a judge too. If I was elected mayor, the title of mayor doesn't mean anything. I'd like to be your guide through government. I'd like to have outside of every office something telling you exactly what you can expect from that office to do for you as its people that pays the taxes. The, uh, the biggest problem that I've always found is that people do have egos, people have rough days, but sometimes we have to sit back and think to ourselves, they're just as human as we are. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me, Mr. Graham? Communication, highly important. In my Airman Leadership training, I was taught how to solve issues just by talking. And it's all about talking. Every day we talk to people, we interact with people, and we have to look at what all the issues are and come to a solution. And I was always trained and told we have to handle everything at the lowest level, if possible, and make sure it doesn't get into any kind of serious cause for the city. All right, thank you. Next question, Mr. Scott, you'll answer first. Uh, we've heard from residents who've been frustrated about property owners who've let their properties go, or absentee landlords aren't maintaining their properties. What would you as mayor do to make sure property owners, especially out-of-town landlords, are, are maintaining their properties? 
if I can say this to you, the first place it has to start is with the neighbor. The neighbor has to get involved with the neighborhood. Everybody has to be part of it. I, I started cleaning up my block, and then everybody started cleaning up. If you see that a neighbor's got a problem with paint, the facade, or whatever, go over there and ask them, are they running into trouble or something? Could you help them out? One of the biggest problems that we have with slum properties, and a lot of people aren't aware of it, is try to find a landlord. Try to find how you're going to bring them here from California, from New York. How you're going to get them here from Jersey. Our warrants that come out of the courts are only good in the state of Pennsylvania. They never respond to them. I will say this. We tried at one time to make it that all the states in the union would have a reciprocal, a reciprocal agreement with the state of Pennsylvania. That if we deem it to be a problem, a quality of life problem, that not only will we issue a warrant for their arrest, we'll ask for their driver's licenses to be suspended. That never went through the House and the Senate, but it's still a great idea. You know why? If you live in New York, you can't drive no more. And where are you going to get your license back? you got to come see us. Thank you. Mr. Graham? In answering this question, it's actually connected to real-world experience actually working in the codes department. When I worked in the codes department, I would get your phone calls, and I would write them down. Then I would enter into the system. And then I would take it uh, into the computer system with the code inspectors in charge of that section. We would go to each property, and we would investigate. We would take photos. Then after the investigation, we give the landlord some time to respond. And when the landlord responded, and it wasn't the way it should have been, we ended up going to court. And every time we went to court, we stood in front of a judge similar to Mr. Scott. And the problem was, they let the landlords go each time. And the reason they did all these seek buddy, buddy things is so, so they can get reelected into the judge position again. And the thing is, if we stop making judges uh, voted pe people into position instead of credentials and qualifications, the housing issue would probably be much better right now. Thank you. Mr. McHale. This is going to sound funny. You're going to think, this is nuts. We have to lighten up. We have to relax a lot of the codes that we have. And I'm not talking about removing health and safety issues. But the nth degree that the codes department violates our spaces is unbelievable. And what kinds of landlords have we attracted to this city? Are they the kinds of landlords you want to see? Or are they the ones that you want to see the ones over in Wyoming missing in West Reading? But we've pushed them out. We've made it so awful for people to do business, and real estate is a business. I mean, it's so difficult for them that we've pushed all the good landlords out. And what do we have? The ones we don't want. Now, this is a long-term solution. It takes a while for this to work out. But we have to have real-world codes inspections that make sense, that do not drive the good landlords out. Thank you. Follow up, Mr. Scott. You know, I really don't attack people, but I, I will say this to you. I, uh, don't, I didn't have a buddy system at a district judge court. Uh, what I did was this. If you had a property and the fine was $1,000, $2,000, I would rather you put the money into the property and bring it back up to a quality of life issue that's in the city of Reading or in the neighborhood so that the property's done right. And then I would give you a break. I gave out more $1,000 fines probably than anybody in the district judge system. But I will say, also at the same time, I believe all the judges share the same integrity. And uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Mr. Graham. The thing is, Mr. Mahill talks about bringing in business. We did. We got the landlords, we got their money, and they got their money. But the thing is, they don't care because they don't live here. And you have people with housing issues with holes in the buildings. And then when they go to complain about it, they go to a judge, and judge lets it go. And then what do they do? They kick the person out of their freaking house, and then they have someone else move in, and they replace that person. When they could have fixed the freaking problem that the problem would have first start. Mr. McHale, follow-up? Well, I do, work in, I do work in commercial real estate. So whenever we talk about real estate issues, they're near and dear to my heart because it's, it's my business. And so when I do look at all these landlords that want to come into the city, I mean, I, I get a lot of calls every day. And businesses and landlords, they want to come to the city, but then when they find out the barriers that the city puts up for them, they turn it off right away. This all comes back to jobs. It all comes back to quality of life. 
and we got to turn everything around so that we attract the businesses and residents back to the city. Thank you. Next question, Mr. Graham. We got into the water system a little bit earlier, but uh, just to go back to that topic, should the city that owns the water system take 11 million from water million, or from, sorry, from water customers' payments each year to balance the city's non-water budget? Can you speak clearer, sir? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Should the city that owns the water system take 11 million from water customers' payments each year to balance the city's non-water budget? Honestly, no. But the thing is, there's a thing called Act 73 which prevents the city from using a asset as a cash cow. Um, $11 million, yeah, that comes in there, but it's, it's to balance the budget and also to fix the sewage system that needed to be fixed for more than 10 years, okay? The funny part is we're talking about $11 million for sewage, for sewage when we had the similar issue back in 2011 when $11 million was moved from the sewage fund and put into other places. And now we're paying for it. And the way they were able to cover up that $11 million bubble then was just by getting a loan and by bouncing the books and make it look like we were only in a $1 million negative equity when actually we were actually much bigger than that. So right now we're paying $11 million for something that happened years ago. Mr. McHale. When you open up your water bill, you're looking at a tax bill. A lot of the money goes to the city. Reading Area Water Authority was created for one purpose, and that's so that they can raise your rates with no state oversight. There's no PUC oversight. They can raise your rates to infinity, and there's nothing you can do about it but pay. So no, the answer to the question is, this is not the way a proper setup of a, of a government and an asset is supposed to be set up. It's, it's, it's crazy the way we've set this thing up. So we should be leasing this out, to an outside organization that would be under PUC rate protection so that it, at a minimum, everybody's rates are protected and we cannot get the kinds of rate increases we have year on year when the city finds itself running out of money and they need mon more money. Mr. Scott? Well, you can't, re you can't lease out an authority with PUC regulations. It would have to be the water department and it would have to be back in the city of Reading. One of the reasons that they basically formed the authority was probably because of the fact that they could give you a hidden tax where you're paying for the increase in your water, your water bills, but they're not increasing your property taxes. Have you ever gone to complaining and everybody tells you at City Hall, well, the water authority's in charge? We're not. Just remember this. The $11 million that they're gonna give back to the city of Reading now, without it, you'll, you'll be bankrupt very quick. What we have to do is start putting and mending that, that they don't do it ever again. And the only way that that can be done is we have to do a forensic audit of where the money's going in the water authority. You'll find the salaries are great, the attorney's making a fortune. Every time he takes a little person to court, $500. If you lose and you appeal it, they get $2,500 to take you to the next level of court. They get paid right away. They don't wait for you to pay the bill, and we're stuck. So. The big boys that are up there running the Water Authority are the ones that are killing Thank you, us. Mr. Scott. Mr. Graham, follow-up? When I think about an audit, they do an audit every year. The reason we don't get the answer is because of political connections. Everyone's trying to hide and protect each other's behinds. Everyone's trying to help each other by covering up the past mistakes, and it's because of policy, uh, party connections. Everyone wants to do each other a favor so the previous guy doesn't look bad. We don't need a forensic audit. We just need someone in place who's actually honest and not connected to the political party trying to protect their behinds. Mr. McHale. Well, among the things that I'm concerned about is corruption. And it lends itself to this particular conversation because one of the initiatives I, I've put into a paper that's on my website now is open checkbook. So you see where every dollar that the city spends online, you can't possibly miss it. So when Mr. Scott talks about forensic audits, I'm assuming he knows the difference between that and a regular audit. When he's talking about audits and financial statements, this is one step toward that so that we all see every dollar. Thank you. Mr. Scott, follow up? I think regular audits, the best way I could tell you that is that a long time ago my parents told me that uh, 
Figures don't lie, but liars figure. A forensic audit tells you and exposes to you who the liars are. If you just go by a budget that the city of Reading gives you, you gotta dig deep. You know, when I got elected to the Reading School Board, that was my first uh, look at the government and how it works when you have to negotiate. I thought, wow, in 1978, I could do a great job. I didn't realize that the administration knew more than I did and hit a lot. So you fought for years just to find out what was wrong. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, we'll take one more question, and then we'll have closing statements. Okay. Uh, Mr. McHale, you're first. Okay. Uh, thousands of Reading residents are struggling in poverty despite doing their very best every day. What does Mayor Can You Do to help them? It all comes back to jobs. Jobs solves a lot of problems, and we don't have the jobs in the city. When I was at the job fair the other day, I talked to a woman who's gonna be interviewing for a job in Lidditz, and I said, that's a long commute, and she said, yes it is, but there's nothing around here. Until we start changing our government policies so that we can attract businesses and residents back to the city, people are always gonna struggle. <coughs> we have to get jobs back in the city. I'm the only one who has actual experience bringing jobs in. I'm the only one with real world business experience and what we need right now is someone who understands business, the language of business, what the businesses need so that we can have jobs and prosperity can break out in every category. And I'm talking about entry level jobs all the way to executive and everything in between. I want jobs <coughs> everywhere. If you, want, if you want a job, come to Reading because we have so many, everybody gets to work. Thank you, Mr. Scott. I think the first thing that you do to help the people of the city of Reading is you start re reducing the cost of government. You also reduce what they charge us. Uh, most of us can't even afford the water bill, let alone the trash bill and the recycling bill and everything put on there. Let's get that part in order so that when we wake up in the morning, we're not worried about the city putting graffiti on our door and condemning it and getting us out the door because they turned the water off. The second part of it is, yeah, everyone needs jobs. But what we have to do is we have to set something up. I told at the beginning of my campaign that I wanted to do a city job corps. I would mirror the federal job corps, where we would do it here in the city of Reading without our children leaving and going to another state. Get them a trade, get them a pride, give, give them more pride. But the most important thing is we can never stop them from dreaming. Dreaming on what they want to be and where they want to go. And we have to keep that family together to support that. Let the parents fight for what we need here in the city. But let, let our children grow up, let our children grow up, let them dream and think about what they can be. Thank you. Mr. Graham. Jobs are important, but you have to start at how do people qualify or get jobs? And what we need to do is, and whoever's the next mayor, is to work hand in hand with the Reagan School District to, pr to find ways to keep people motivated to stay in school. When they drop out of school, they are pretty much <coughs> limiting their capability to get a job down the road. They're limiting their ability to even be competitive with the people who live outside the city who want those same limited jobs. And if we find a way to keep people in school and find ways to have them be competitive from the first day they graduate from high school with some kind of official certification recognized by an accredited university or community college, they will have a foot up against everyone who lives outside the city so they can get those jobs rather than the people outside the city. Thank you. Mr. McHale, follow-up? Everyone in Reading is burdened by high taxes. And the best way to help families, workers, and seniors is to make sure they have more money in their pockets. If we continue to elect the same leaders, we're going to see the same results. Higher taxes, lost jobs, lower service. I want to break that cycle and put more money in your pocket. Mr. Scott, follow-up? I think you're breaking that cycle now. There's nobody sitting at this table that's ever been mayor of Reading nor have we, any of us ever been council people. I think that uh, what, I, what I would like to do again is get our kids, our children, make them hold on to their dreams. When you walk down the street with them, what do we do? Why do we go to work every day? To come home and tell them that it's worth it. Keep the problems away from them. We won't have the problems that we have in schools. And just at all times when they dream, tell them they can accomplish anything they want to. That will change the city of Reading. Thank you. Mr. Graham, follow up. What we need to do to change the cycle is to reinstall in everyone's mind the importance of education. And by not having the education, we are limiting ourselves to having 
a good paying job. We need to reinvest into our children and show them what hard work can get you in life rather than taking things or expecting things to say. That's one thing I think a lot of us are always upset with when we see people who feel entitled to things rather than work hard for those things. All right, thank you. Each of you now will have a 90 second closing. Mr. Scott, it's your turn to go first. I wish all of us had three minutes, but here we go. I, I'm running for the mayor's chair because of the fact that sitting on the bench for many years, I just thought a lot of the laws that they started writing from past administrations weren't to cure the problem in the city of Reading, but was to make money. If you have a quality of life issue and there's a problem that exists, you don't give them a $50 fine, they don't clean it up, you give them a $200 fine. They don't clean it up, you give them a $400 fine. They don't clean it up, you bring it to a judge for $1,000. Wouldn't have been cheaper if we just went up and cleaned it up and gave them the bill. That's one problem. The second thing is, I'm a people person. I told everybody that if I'm elected, I'm gonna move the mayor's office downstairs, why? I wanna be the first person that you see when you come in, the last one you go out. If you have a problem with anybody in City Hall, stop and see me. But if they, at the same time, if they have a problem with you and you stop to see me, we're gonna to try to rationalize and see what happens. I bring something unique to the chair. One, people always say, well, how do you solve the problems of people? You sit and listen to them. You don't say you've got all the answers and then you try to figure out what you can do. And if there's nothing available, you make it happen. I sat for many, many years knowing that one person's gonna leave that courtroom happy and the other one might be mad. You know what I always push for? I push that you both left feeling that you got a good representation and I was fair with you. I bring that with me. I want you to know this because a lot of people are confused. I am the only Democrat running for mayor of the city of Reading. Other people try to say that they are, but I am the only one and I would really appreciate if you vote for me on November 3rd. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Graham? I'm here running for mayor because many of you helped me get here. I'm a product, directly or indirectly, you guys helped me get here to this point. And I'm not here to represent a political party or political agenda. I'm here to represent every one of you here. I grew up here in Reading, born and raised, like many of you here. I'm one of you. I'm not a businessman. I'm not a, a person who's, who's up here talking about real world experience in the business world. The business world hasn't helped us at all. The business world has actually has helped us get into worse situations. The business person hasn't done anything or can relate mostly to anything that we deal with because they are in their own little cushy world. Now, in regards to past experiences, you know, you know, I'm the person up here who's telling a lot of the facts with a lot of the truth. And I can relate a lot of things that are going on in the city in comparison to the other two. I don't represent a party, I represent the people. That's what it means to be independent. To be independent means to represent the small people, the people who have been walked on or walked all over for more than 20 years in the city, the people who are outside struggling to find lives, struggling to take care of their families. And what we're talking about is nothing that actually is here to help them, but Act 47 Thank you. and receivership. Mr. McHale. Well, again, I'd like to thank the Reading Eagle and the Reading Area Community College and our inquisitors. Um, for, and everybody here for their time. In an effort to bring transparency to City Hall, I've been releasing comprehensive policy plans on my website with corruption, economic uh, uh, opportunity, and safety. My website's mikhailformayor.com. So go out there and you'll get a lot more details about how this is. I'll be releasing more plans soon. Reading is at a turning point in its history. We entered Act 47 six years ago and we will either exit Act 47 by 2019 on our own or go into receivership. That's the decision. This election decides the city's future for better or for worse. We need a mayor with real world experience who can actually help the city and fix its problems. I do not want to see the city's assets liquidated. I don't want to see Reading fall into bankruptcy. I want to fix the root cause problems that I have seen and identified. As your mayor, I will implement common sense solutions so Reading can exit Act 47 
by the end of my first year in office. I want to make Reading better for everyone who calls Reading home. My name is Jim McHale, and I want to earn your vote on November 3rd. Thank you. That concludes the forum. I'd like to thank everyone for coming tonight, especially Brett Balder here at the center for help, his help and the RAC administration for hosting the event. Remember, next Wednesday, right here at 6 o'clock, we'll have a forum with the four county commissioner candidates. And also, please go out and vote on November 3rd. Again, thank you for coming. Have a good night.